Okay, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Climate Action Trackers webinar on pulling the plug on fossil fuels in the power sector. Uh, my name is Claire Fison. I'm co-head of our climate policy team here at Climate Analytics, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. And I have here with me today from the climate analytics side, Bill Hare, our CEO, uh, Neil Grant, who led the analysis behind today's webinar, and then um, we also have Hannah Picketer, who works on the Climate Action Tracker for New Climate Institute's side. On the agenda today is our analysis of what's needed in the power sector to align with the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree warming limit, which we've released today. We aim to keep the presentations to about half an hour, and then we'll have time for a Q&A at the end. So um, Bill Hare will kick us off with some scene setting uh, to bring us all up to speed on where we are at on global climate action. Neil Grant will then walk us through the analysis that we've done of power sector benchmarks aligned to 1.5 degrees and will give us a taster of the results. And finally, Hannah Fikita will take a look at what countries are doing at the moment and whether any are on track for the changes of the power sector that we need to see. Um, a little bit of housekeeping uh, in the next slide. So the chat function is disabled. If you'd like to submit a question, um, and we encourage you to do so, please click on the Q&A icon in the bottom of your screen. All attendees are muted and have video disabled, um, but yeah, please use this Q&A function um, and feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentations. There's no need to wait until the Q&A session has started. Uh, we'll try and answer as many questions as possible, but um, our apologies if we don't manage to get to yours. Uh, and if you could, please also include your full name and your organization. Um, if you encounter any technical difficulties, please also use the Q&A function and we'll try our best to resolve the issue. So with that, let's begin. Bill, over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks, Claire. Um, and hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, uh, just ahead of the Climate Ambition Summit here in New York. Uh, next slide, please, Rongji. I wanted to just uh, give you a quick update on where the world stands. Um, the UNFCC's, the Climate Convention's Global Stock Take was published recently, and it shows, as I think everyone's aware, that we're way off track in terms of meeting uh, climate goals under the Paris Agreement. The, the Paris Agreement uh, NDCs, the, the uh, individual country commitments, uh, lead to 2030 emissions far above levels compatible with one and a half degrees. And one of the main messages from this global stock take is that we need to ramp up uh, renewable power uh, globally, which will be the subject of the second part of this webinar, and phase out fossil fuels as rapidly as possible. Another important message is that it's still possible to limit warming to the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree limit, but that window is closing and we need to act now. Next slide, please, Rongjin. So we know from the IPCC uh, science reviews uh, committed in the last few years that the warming that we're seeing now is unprecedented. It's not just, of course, global warming that's unprecedented. And many of the extreme events that we're seeing now are unprecedented. Um, and the warming levels now are equivalent to any uh, in the last 125,000 years. CO2 concentrations continue to rise. Uh, so we're really in uncharted space now uh, from the climate perspective. Next slide. We know that the uh, this year has been the hottest on record. Um, various research groups have, have, an, have announced this um, and that the, the northern summer this year was the hottest by far. And as far as we can tell, it's been the hottest year since the end of the last interglacial 125,000 years or so ago. Um, alongside this has been really a lot of extreme events that have been happening that have caused devastation. We won't go through that, but that sets the context for uh, this update. The next slide, please. So the record-breaking heat is sounding the alarm all around the world. Um, we're seeing really extreme uh, weather events uh, precipitating uh, real crises. The catastrophe in Libya is just one recent example. And what's really important to take away from this is that these really extreme heat, drought, flooding is occurring at only one 1.2 degrees of warming 
global mean warming above pre-industrial. And what the IPCC report has shown and nearly everything published ever since that was finished is that the only way to limit these damages is to keep warming to the one and a half degree level in the Paris Agreement. In other words, that warming limit is really quite essential to minimizing the damage. And to get there, we need to peak emissions by 2025, to peak global greenhouse gas emissions by 2025, and halve them by 2030 on a pathway to net zero by mid-century is about the only way that we have to limit warming to one and a half degrees. So next slide, please. Now, from the Climate Action Tracker, we annually update uh, where the combined effect of countries' uh, uh, actions and targets are leading us. Right now, our update from November last year shows that the targets on the table, 2030 targets lead to warming by end of century uh, to 2.4 degrees. Current policies are not on track even to meet those targets and heading towards a warming of 2.7 degrees, close to three degrees, in fact, by 2100. So the ambition summit on this week uh, called by the Secretary General of the United Nations is aimed at getting countries to step up those targets and step up those actions to really close the gap. Next slide, please. There's been hardly any progress uh, since the COP uh, recently and last year, uh, which is very disappointing. Countries have been called on to strengthen their NDCs, but very few have actually stepped up to make that, uh, 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 that in in increase ambition real. So that's one of the big problems we're seeing now is there's a, a falling off willingness to, to step up action, um, which is very concerning. Next slide, please. We know now that from all of the scientific assessments that it's really governments that need to step up and, and compel and regulate, demand more action from their companies and their countries to close what is really a very big emission gap. The emission gap is slow, has reduced a bit in the last years, but not anywhere near enough to close where uh, emissions are headed under current policies and actions and the 1.5 degree compatible pathway. So this is really critical. Now, the next slide, please, shows that there has been some progress since the Paris Agreement was adopted. And this is, this is one view of it. Um, policies and actions have reduced uh, warming, projected warming levels from over three degrees, three and a half degrees towards 2.7 degrees. There's been an improvement in the targets um, over the period since the Paris Agreement was adopted and so on. Um, and another way of looking at it is in the next figure, please, next slide, which shows the, the reduction in the warming level over time. In fact, since we started the Climate Action Tracker back in 2009. So the, the message to take away here is that the Paris Agreement is working, but it's not working fast enough. And to some extent, the rate of improvement in countries' commitments and actions has slowed down. At the very time that we're seeing uh, really critical uh, temperatures emerging globally, major changes in uh, the Earth system, massive loss of Antarctic sea ice this year, which is raising alarm bells throughout the scientific community. This is what needs to change this year if we're going to take things forward. Next slide, please. Now, the good thing is that there's plenty of opportunities to actually reduce emissions. So, in particular, we're going to focus on renewables, uh, and we need to really ramp up uh, the rollout of new wind and solar, fivefold um, to 1.5 terawatts per year by 2030. There needs to be a global renewable energy target set, electricity target set. Next slide, please. And essentially, we need to be tripling renewable energy capacity globally by 2030 at a minimum to get onto uh, a one and a half degree pathway. The G20 meeting recently um, made some. Uh, uh, let's say, commitments in this direction, but it was f far from sufficient. Um, there was no real commitment to phase out fossil fuels, um, which is absolutely essential to making progress towards 1.5 degrees. And that's one of the big discussions here in New York. Now, next slide, please. Um, I think we, I just want to hand over now to uh, Neil Grant, who's going to step through the 1.5 degree uh, power sector benchmarks. 
cleaning up the power sector is absolutely fundamental to being able to get to one and a half degrees. So over to you, Neil. Thanks, Bill. So I'm going to talk you through the 1.5 compatible benchmarks that we're releasing today for the power sector. So if we could go to the next slide. What do these benchmarks cover? Well, they're focused on the electricity mix. So the share of electricity that comes from coal, fossil gas, or renewables in a given country. And we're covering the period from now out to 2050. Uh, we focus on the share of electricity generation rather than the total generation from coal or renewables, because that enables better comparability between countries which might have very different size power sectors. Um, and today we're releasing these benchmarks for the world as a whole, but also for 16 countries, which you can see highlighted on this map. And we'd love to extend this to more countries if possible. Next slide, please. How have we established these benchmarks? Well, in this report, we use two different lines of evidence, a global perspective and a national perspective. So the global perspective comes from scenarios which are assessed by the IPCC's AR6 report. Um, and this report gave some of the latest evidence on the transformations that we need to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. But we know that some global pathways rely heavily on carbon dioxide removal, um, and this is really risky and could have large negative side effects. Um, and so we filter these pathways to only consider 32 1.5 compatible pathways which have low reliance on CDR. And as an outcome of that filtering process, these pathways also have limited fossil CCS deployment. We then downscale these pathways to the national level. So the data that's provided in these global pathways is at a regional level. For example, giving a picture of the power mix for the whole of Europe. And downscaling converts this into a set of self-consistent country level pathways. And that gives a picture of what an individual country would need to do to achieve this global transition. Now this global perspective gives a very strong link back to the global 1.5 degree limit. We know that the power sector mix for every country is part of a global pathway that when we add it up across all countries and across all sectors will limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And this top down perspective is very useful, but it doesn't necessarily capture all of the in country circumstances, which might also guide the energy transition. And therefore we complement this global perspective with a national perspective. This is based on an in-depth review of the existing national studies on power sector decarbonization. So we've reviewed over 300 pathways produced by over 250 different papers. Um, and we've been selecting pathways which are sufficiently ambitious, which use robust methodology and which consider the potential for electricity demand growth. And uh, we also ensure that the pathways we select are still compatible with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. And this gives a perspective which more fully represents national circumstances. Let's go on to the next slide to see some of the benchmarks that we established using this method. So let's start with coal. Phasing out coal-fired power remains one of the most critical steps that we need to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. We need a global phase out of coal by 2040 in the power sector, but it's important that this phase out isn't a straight line to zero. It needs to be faster than this. So by 2030, coal should be providing under 5% of global electricity generation. We also see that there is no room for coal with carbon capture and storage in the power sector. These benchmarks that we're releasing today are for total fossil fuel use in the power sector, not just focusing on the unabated component. So we, have, we see a total phase out of all coal, not just so-called unabated coal. Um, and the days of clean coal are really over and we need to see coal-fired CCS in the power sector uh, for what it really is, a dangerous distraction. Next slide, please. Let's look at what this global coal phase out looks like at a national level. So this figure shows our benchmarks for each of the 16 countries that we've analyzed. And what we see is that developed countries need to take the lead and phase out coal by 2030 from their power sectors. Developing countries phase out coal by 2040, but there are still very strong reductions this decade. In most countries, coal should be providing under 10% of power by 2030. In some coal intensive grids, such as India and South Africa, the share in 2030 is slightly higher, but not by much. Now this action will require substantial international support, 
The benchmarks we're releasing today show what needs to happen to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, but not who needs to pay. And it's clear that developed countries who've enjoyed decades of coal intensive power throughout the 20th century need to step up and support the coal transition around the world. Next slide, please. If we move from coal onto gas, there's been growing focus on the need to phase out coal in recent years, and we're beginning to see results here with the pipeline for new coal plants shrinking about two thirds since the Paris Agreement. But almost as important as the need to phase out coal is the need to phase out fossil gas in the power sector. So this chart here shows our global benchmark. Um, and in this 1.5 compatible benchmark, the share of gas falls rapidly to under 10% by 2030, 1% 1 by 2040 and further by 2050. So gas is not a bridging fuel, it's a fossil fuel and it needs to be phased out. Again, these benchmarks here are for total gas use, not just unabated fossil gas generation. And so the direction for all fossil gas, whether equipped with CCS or without is the same. It's one of swift decline. In our benchmarks, unabated fossil gas should be totally phased out by 2040. And post 2040, there is then at best a very small role for fossil gas equipped with CCS which provides less than 1% of global electricity demand by 2050. However, the CAT sees that even this minimal role for fossil gas with CCS could fall to zero if wind and solar and batteries continue their precipitous cost declines and other sources of zero carbon flexibility such as demand side response continue to develop. And so the CAT therefore calls for governments to avoid relying on CCS in the power sector and effectively phase out all fossil gas by 2040. Next slide, please. If we look at what this looks like at the country level, we see that developed, co developed countries need to lead the way, phasing out fossil gas by 2035 from their electricity mix. But if you look at many developing developed countries on this chart, the EU, the UK, Australia, for example, uh, the share of fossil gas by 2030 is already less than 5%. So we need really strong action this side of 2030. Developing countries are not far behind, phasing out fossil gas by 2040. But it's also important to highlight there are a wide range of developing countries which haven't moved into fossil gas in the first place, such as South Africa or India, which has very low shares of fossil gas. And these countries, more than phasing out fossil gas by 2040, should avoid moving into fossil gas in the first place and avoid the gas development trap. Next slide, please. There are many benefits to avoiding the fossil gas trap. First, developing countries have vast renewable potential, which is often largely untapped. And the declines we've seen in the cost of wind and solar mean that renewables are now undercutting volatile and expensive fossil fuels as a source of electricity generation. And avoiding the fossil gas trap will help countries to make the most of their domestic renewable potentials. On the other hand, if moving into fossil gas is a recipe for stranded assets as renewables continue to undercut fossil fuels and additional debt burden as large scale investments into fossil gas infrastructure fail to yield a return. The good news is that we're seeing many countries are clear that the way forwards is renewables, not fossil gas, as evidenced, for example, by the Africa Climate Summit outcome in Nairobi earlier this month. But there are barriers which will need to be addressed to help countries avoid the gas development trap. Next slide, please, Rongji. So the power sector transition is a story of two tracks. We've got the fossil phase out track, which is critically important and which we've been discussing in the previous slides. But we can't just pull the plug on fossil fuels. We need to plug renewables into the grid. And as global demand for electricity grows, we need to sh be sure that we're meeting that demand with clean electrons. Um, and the CAT finds that to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, renewables should provide over 80% of global generation by 2030. If we put that in gross terms, that means that renewable generation needs to more than treble to over 26,000 terawatt hours by 2030. And I just want to make a brief point here on the call to triple renewables capacity by 2030, for which there's momentum building, particularly after the G20 summit. Our view is that tripling is broadly the right ambition level, although we would see this as a floor that needs to be gone beyond rather than a ceiling. 
But we also need to provide clarity on what tripling really means. It means a huge expansion of wind and solar, more like fivefold growth relative to a 2022 baseline. It will require new policies and initiatives. And most importantly, we need action to ensure that rene renewables rollout happens everywhere and no countries left behind. The hardest work needs to happen this side of 2030, more than doubling the share of renewables in the electricity mix. But while action over the next seven years is of critical importance, the destination is also clear. We're racing towards 100% renewables in the power sector by 2050. Next slide, please. If we look at this race at the country level, we see that renewables must click into overdrive in every country to deliver a 1.5 degree aligned renewables rollout. Developing countries should be targeting over 80% renewables in their power sectors by 2030, with developing countries not far behind. While the shares in developing countries are sometimes lower in 2030, around the 50 to 75% mark, by 2035, all countries should be over 80% renewable in the power sector. By 2040, we're looking at around 90% or above. And by 2050, all countries should be at or close to 100% renewables in the power sector. Again, we reiterate these benchmarks that we're releasing today. They show what needs to happen to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, but do not address where the finance to drive this transition should come from. And international support is, of course, going to be essential to help developing countries benefit fully from their own renewable potentials and ensure that the global energy transition leaves no one behind. Next slide, please. Um, as well as mapping out the path to a clean electricity system, we also review the pace of change in the power sector at the moment. So this graph here shows the share of wind and solar across the 16 countries we're producing benchmarks for and how that's developed over the past 20 years. And it also shows how this the share of wind and solar could grow out to 2050 if wind and solar keep climbing up the S curve. And what we see is that across the world, wind and solar are entering a phase of explosive exponential growth. And if they continue on this track, wind and solar will provide over a third of global power by 2030, and that will push the total renewable share up to about 50%. This is a really good start but clearly more work needs to be done to reach the 80% renewables established in our global benchmark. But what we do see is that across a range of countries in different geographical and economic contexts, that rapid change is possible. And this should give us hope that these benchmarks, if supported by sufficient political and financial capital can be achieved. Next slide, please. This has been an overview of some of the key messages arising from our latest report. And I would really encourage you to read the full report You know, with 16 countries and four different benchmarks and the accompanying briefing. There's a lot of detail in there that we really hope will be useful to the climate community as we seek to build ambition around the global energy transition. But the overall outcome of the transition is clear. Zero carbon power everywhere for everyone. Pulling the plug on fossil fuels would lead to clean electricity by 2040, within a generation's time. And this should remain the North Star of the global power sector transition. With that, I'd like to hand on to my colleague Hannah, who will provide an overview of how governments are currently doing on pulling the plug on fossil fuels. Thank you, Nia. Um, yes, in the accompanying briefing that Nia mentioned, we checked for the 16 countries how they are doing and uh, whether they are likely to get on track for a 1.5 compatible development um, in the power sector or not. And next slide, please. We um, looked at these countries here across coal, fossil gas and renewables, and I'll take you through this graphic um, column by column, starting with coal. And here we already have our um, highlight, um, which is actually one element of 1.5 degree compatibility. Um, we found that the coal exit of the UK is in fact um, compatible with the benchmarks that we've calculated. Um, so they're phasing out next year already, 2024. And um, that is the only country that we found of those that we've assessed, um, which is in the era of coal 1.5 compatible and in fact also in the other technologies. And there are a few com um, countries with very promising um, aspirations um, that includes, for example, Chile, where um, they are aspiring to phase out coal by 2030, Germany similarly. Um, so those would be um, really 1.5 compatible if they set that into legislation and pulled through um, with that aspiration. Um, 
a couple of countries are in the mixed picture category um, where government action on the national level, for example, varies a bit from the state level or where they just can't get through to actually making a commitment to phasing out coal, um, just haven't made announcements and that could still follow. Um, but then we also have a bigger problem with many countries that are effectively just planning with coal capacities in the long run. And that's the bottom section here on the left that you can see here. On fossil gas, um, the picture is even more mixed and potentially worrying. Um, as Neil said, for coal, many countries are now starting to talk about a phase out or, or effectively phasing out coal. Um, for fossil gas, the picture is very different. And we see that even some of the countries that are doing pretty good on coal and renewables are actually going in the wrong direction for fossil gas. That includes um, Chile and Germany, interestingly, and um, also some other countries um, further down. Um, in the fossil gas section, we only have two countries that are going in the right direction, according to our assessment, which are India and China, and they both have a very low share of gas currently in the power sector and um, are also not planning to massively increase capacity. So they would be technically under our um, threshold for 1.5 compatibility, but they don't have a clear commitment to that. So they would still need to really make sure that they don't exceed the limits here. On renewable energy, we have a slightly different categorization because we find that all countries are in fact adding capacities, um, but the speed of increase of renewables varies a lot. Um, again, let me start with Chile and Germany who are really um, ahead of the pack here and really pushing um, the limits and and um, and yeah, every year again are implementing new policies and the dynamics in the sector both in terms of policy making, but also what's happening on the ground is very dynamic and, and really going in a very good direction. Um, many, many countries are adding a lot of capacities and are already also pushing it and um, trying to improve legislation or in fact are improving legislation, um, yet not at a sufficient speed. And that's the mixed picture category here. Um, so they really need to speed up still quite a bit um, for some countries that is even more difficult because they have a very strongly growing electricity generation still. Um, that is, for example, Indonesia, where demand ex is expected to grow. So increasing the share of renewables is not only replacing existing capacities with renewables, but also really increasing the power sector size overall. Japan and Mexico are lagging behind in, in the renewables area because uh, Japan has very weak targets and Mexico even rolled back some support for new renewable energy. On the next slide, I would like to dive a bit into the um, additional plant capacities. So we see that for coal, this is, although it has really decreased a lot, um, and Neil said it, the capacity has decreased, uh, sorry, the, the plans for adding capacities have decreased by two thirds since the Paris Agreement. Um, there's still a massive coal pipeline here. Um, and for a 1.5 compatible pathway, we need to decrease this by now. We need to get out of coal latest by 2035. So this is really um, an issue still. Any new coal fire power plant is, is a major threat to 1.5 degrees Celsius. For gas, the picture is a little bit different and potentially even more worrisome because um, the, the capacity shouldn't are planned across many, many countries. So it's not that one country needs to phase out gas, but there has to be really globally the recognition that gas is in fact not a transition fuel, but it is a fuel that has to phase out. Um, and um, yeah, while we see these additions, of course, we are always struggling to, to phase out what we have and existing infrastructure is already a problem. Um, and uh, these any additions will just make these efforts much more difficult. Um, on the good side of this, um, you may have seen the numbers for renewable energy capacity additions and um, IEA estimates that for 2023 we'll have more than 440 gigawatts of renewables So um, in just one year. So we, we do see that our renewables are overtaking fossils in terms of capacity additions. All right, on the next slide I'll try to summarize our findings a little bit. So we do see a lot of progress. But of course, much more is possible and necessary. And as a reminder, I've pasted Neil's graphic here 
on the um, carbon intensity of the electricity sector overall. And you can really see this steep, steep, steep decline as of now until 2030. Um, and fossils have to leave the power sector by 2035 in developed countries and 2040 globally, which just means a very rapid decline as of now and across all countries. Um, and I can just reiterate that we do not see a role for CCS for coal. And the modeling does see a small role for gas at best, but effectively we do not think that um, fossil gas uh, should be equipped with CCS if there are alternatives, because it's just not um, competitive with renewables. Um, renewable electricity really needs to be pushed towards 100%. Um, this means that particularly solar and wind have to increase a lot. So we um, have framed our indicators around clean electricity, and there's a few countries that do have nuclear um, in the mix. So we don't get to 100% uh, under all scenarios, but what we really see is that renewables are the future, renewables are the cheapest source and are sustainable. Um, what we do see from the Im implementation in the countries is that this is very mixed and that in some countries, the dynamics are really speeding up, mm, but there are countries where this is not yet happening or um, even whole regions where the growth is much slower um, than in other countries. And this is something that has to be um, tackled. So we really need a um, global growth and very rapid growth. Um, yes, and how, how do we get there? This is going to be a challenge. Um, it's definitely not easy. And what is most important is that we do this so that it is beneficial to the people. And I think the, yeah, Bill has shown the climate impacts. So I think we don't need to talk about how important it is to mitigate the climate, but these transitions um, can also be really supportive of justice, um, of sustainability um, in countries. And um, they have so many multiple benefits. Um, that they, um, yeah, if they're set up in a right way, in a just and sustainable way, um, such a transition can ben be beneficial to people. Um, so the finance and international cooperation really needs to make sure that um, countries are enabled to join this transition and, and profit from it. Um, and um, with that, I think I will move on to handing this over to Claire Feisen again. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, Neil and Hannah for this fantastic overview. Um, so yeah, we now have quite a bit of time for questions um, and we've seen a lot of activity in the Q&A channel already. So thank you for um, yeah, engaging with this really nicely, everyone. Um, so let's start with a couple of clarifying questions, um, which I will first direct at Neil. So first of all, um, we've got a question on whether our figures include fugitive emissions, um, fugitive methane emissions from coal and fossil gas. Um, secondly, what are the specific reasons for why we think um, CCS cannot play a role in abating emissions of coal and gas power generation? And then uh, our last clarifying question on why these 16 countries in particular. Um, over to you, Neil. Thanks, Claire. So on the first question, the emissions intensity numbers that we provide don't include fugitive emissions from coal and fossil gas. They're focused on the CO2 emissions, which uh, come when those fossil fuels are burned. Um, but we know that fugitive uh, methane and fossil methane needs to be reduced really quickly. If we want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, we need to cut it by about two thirds um, by 2030. Um, and the, the existence of fugitive emissions upstream in fossil fuels is just another reason to accelerate the phase out of fossil fuels uh, faster. Um, so, yeah, that would be my answer there. Um, on the second question around CCS, um, I would say, you know, as the Climate Action Tracker reviewing all of the evidence, we feel there's a very compelling case that uh, CCS is not fit for purpose in power sector decarbonisation. But I'd just highlight that this is not an input to our analysis. We didn't uh, prematurely exclude uh, scenarios with CCS, but it's rather that as we filter for carbon dioxide removal, as we select the latest pathways that uh, capture the, the cost reductions in renewables, actually what we see from the modeling uh, is that 
CCS has a very marginal role at best. And I think the reasons for that are threefold. And um, I think first, it's important to highlight CCS could be low carbon, but it's never going to be zero carbon. You're never going to have perfect capture rates on your emission stream. And as we've just been talking about, there's upstream emissions from fossil fuel extraction too. And if we need to get to zero carbon, we need to be cutting as much emissions as possible and leaving low carbon sources, which would need to be balanced by some form of carbon dioxide removal, isn't really the best solution. Secondly, CCS doesn't really, you know, its track record of the past few decades is very poor. Over 80% of CCS demonstration projects have ended in failure. That's not a track record which I want to be banking on uh, in a critical decade for power sector decarbonisation. And thirdly, I think we're just seeing more and more that CCS is not the critical technology that it's sometimes been presented as. As the modelling as as the modelling develops and as the cost of renewables continues to fall, we see more and more that actually renewables are ready to meet uh, future and and provide zero carbon power without CCS. So I don't think it's needed. Um, in terms of why we selected these 16 countries, there's a range of different uh, reasons. First is the scale of emissions. So these countries cover over three quarters of global power sector emissions um, currently. Also, we're thinking about geopolitical importance. For example, we thought it was really important to scrutinize the UAE as uh, they're hosting COP this year. And we also wanted to select uh, countries with a diversity of different existing energy system mixes. So that hopefully these 16 countries can provide a uh, shared other countries as well because they have a diverse range. Um, but I would highlight that we would certainly love to extend this to more countries if possible um, in the future. So watch this space. Great. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, so another question has come in on um our capacity to meet the 1.5 degree goal. So some some kind of skeptic skepticism that um, the world will be able to meet the goal and also highlighting that there are no plans in place in order to actually achieve it. Uh, bringing up the, the fact that China is continuing to build coal plants um, and continues to be an enormous emitter. And meanwhile, the US uh, doubling its efforts to um, well, also fossil fuel, um, um, develop fossil fuel production infrastructure. Uh, and so um, we've got a question on should we um, reset and develop new strategies? What should we do here? And maybe I would ask Bill to take a stab at this question. And as you answer, perhaps you could reflect on what you think uh, this means for uh, the, the Climate Ambition Summit happening this week. Yeah, um, look, thanks, Claire. And thanks for the question. Actually, it's an important question. Uh, firstly, though, uh, we know from the IPCC, uh, UN assessments and others that meeting the one and a half degree goal of the Paris Agreement is still actually possible. It's geophysically possible, which means that if we can reduce emissions fast enough um, in line with the, with the most advanced scenarios, then we have a reasonable chance of limiting warming to one and a half degrees. Um, in the next decade or two. Of course, the big question is, will the world be able to do that? Will we actually be able to reduce emissions fast enough? And I think everyone's concerned about the build-up of coal uh, plant in China. But alongside that, we have to remember that there's also an absolutely massive exponential growth of renewable capacity in China going on. And we're seeing its renewable energy targets for 2025 already met. We're seeing a massive growth in uh, electric vehicle uh, market share in China and elsewhere. So the picture for China is, um, is not as clear as the question in implies. I think we uh, believe it's still possible for China to peak its emissions in the coming years and reduce them. We skeptical that the new coal plant that are being built will actually be used but there of course remains a concern the us of course um, has its ira act which is going to really substantially reduce emissions but against that we see the us also um, uh, permitting new uh, fossil fuel developments particularly gas and oil which is a really big problem the question also asks about the military security context as well. 
And I think that's really important. What we know, uh, and many um, national defense agencies have studied this, is that climate change itself is a major security risk to many countries because of the range of different impacts that will occur in country and that will create threats or changes external to countries that uh, create all sorts of challenges, um, including forced migration and so on. And we know the best way to limit these threats is actually to stick to the Paris Agreement's one and a half degree limit. We know that we will absolutely limit all of the really damaging changes that will create uh, catastrophes at the humanitarian level, overflowing into potential security issues, um, is a really fundamental thing to understand. Finally, um, energy security is a big concern uh, for many countries, rightly so. And we know the best way to secure energy security is by using indigenous renewable energy capacity and expanding that, reducing the reliance on imported fossil fuels, both an economic development and an energy security benefit. So I think there's no real case for resetting um, the, the Paris Agreement target. And I think that's one of the big drivers this week um, at the Climate Ambition Summit is to bring all these issues together, to bring the finance question that Hannah's mentioned together, to unlock finance for the expansion of renewable energy, particularly in Africa, but other places as well, create the benefits for everyone. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, another question, a few questions actually coming in on whether we can comment on the role for nuclear and uh, for any other kind of baseload um, technologies. So Neil, perhaps I could go back to you for that one. Yeah, thanks, Claire. Um, so I think the first thing to say about nuclear, so nuclear currently provides about 9% of global electricity generation, and that's an important contribution. Um, and the, the main enemy is fossil fuels, and we need to phase out fossil fuels as fast as possible. And where there's existing nuclear in a grid that can you know, accelerate that phase out, then it's providing an important role. But when we look at new generation and in you know transitioning to the, to the grid of the future, we don't see nuclear as the solution to the climate crisis. Uh, and that's for a range of reasons. It's partly economic. If you look at the cost of uh, nuclear electricity from nuclear compared to the cost of renewables, the cost of nuclear is much higher, and it's also going in the wrong direction. It's often getting more expensive around the world. If we look at uh, the compatibility of nuclear, which is often quite inflexible, uh, operating inside a grid dominated by wind and solar, where what we really need is flexibility, um, we don't see nuclear as the solution as a whole. So while it does provide important zero carbon energy at the moment, um, and can help us uh, accelerate the phase out of fossil fuels. When we're talking about new generation, it's clear that the picture will be one of renewables. Um, if we go on to talk about baseload, um, I think I would say that baseload to me is not a concept which is actually fit for the grids of the future. Um, that ba you know, baseload is a concept for 20th century grids, and we need to be building 21st century grids. And these 21st century grids are going to be dominated by wind and solar. You know, when we see the cost de declines in wind and solar and their competitiveness and the way that their deployments accelerating around the world, I think that that direction is clear. And if you have grids with lots of wind and solar, what you need is not base load, but flexibility. And that flexibility can come from lots of different sources. It could come from the demand side as we, um, you know, as digitization unlocks new potential to flex demand. Um, and and match our electricity demand to the supply. Uh, flexibility can come through interconnection and uh, allowing different grids to connect with one another more. And of course, flexibility can come from generation technologies like pumped hydro or uh, hydro green hydrogen turbines uh, or a range of other things. Um, but that's what we really need to be focusing on is what are the sources of zero carbon flexibility that can support wind and solar rather than uh, being concerned around base load itself. Great, thank you very much, Neil. Um, okay, a few, moving on, we've had a few questions on um, how we're going to halve emissions by 2030. So this 
Um, what we've seen from the IPCC is said that we need to decline emissions very rapidly um, over the rest of this decade, um, but emissions are continuing to rise. Um, and so what do we think about how, how we can achieve that? Um, Hannah, perhaps I could go to you to start on this one. Thank you, yes. Um... So what we're looking at in this um, analysis here is the power sector. And um, if we can um, get the necessary developments in any sector, then it's definitely the power sector. So we do have a wealth of policy instruments at our disposal. We have decreasing costs of renewables. We have um, really um, good experience on integrating high shares of variable renewables in grids. Um, we, we know how to do this. And I think what we're now also picking up is really entering into a dialogue between countries on, on what has to happen for a just transition. So really thinking about how um, local communities are affected by a shift from fossils to renewables and really thinking this through and setting up um, policies and regulation and support um, that make this work. So I think for the power sector, um, this is possible. Um, for all other sectors, as Bill said, it is, it is also possible. Um, this is not, um, yeah, it's in our hands. We we do have the choice. So we, we do need to implement really drastic changes um, to still, um, yeah, hit this mark. But if we well, we already see very drastic changes from climate change impacts. And I think the question is a bit, um, yeah, do we want to shape these drastic changes and do we actually want to steer into a direction that is going to be beneficial in the long term for um, humanity or um, yeah, not. And I think actually, I mean, I say we have the choice, but in fact, we don't have the choice. We have to do this. So there's, there's no way around. Um, otherwise, um, this is not going to end well. Um, and I think this, the fact that we are progressing in time, we have been increasing emissions, but also things have not stood still. No? We have developed many things. We actually see, in fact, for many countries that emissions have peaked or are beginning to peak also for large developing countries. Um, so we, we have still many tools at our hand. Thanks, Hannah. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on that or should I move on? Okay. Um, then a terminology question, uh, but a very valid one. What is the difference between fossil gas and natural gas? Uh, Neil? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, I guess one of the ways that you could think about this is I'd say fossil gas is a phrase that the fossil lobby doesn't like, uh, while natural gas is an advertising tool for them. I mean, I, to, to me, I think the reason why we and many of us in the climate movement are moving away from using the phrase natural gas and moving to fossil gas, they're, they're both talking about the same molecule, CH4, methane, um, but is that, you know, there has been such a concerted push from uh, the fossil industry and particularly, yeah, from, from the gas industry to label gas as a clean fuel, as a transition fuel, as something which has a, a key role to play in decarbonisation. And um, I think the framing of natural gas has sort of gives quite a positive lens uh, to that fuel. And so, um, yeah, fossil gas is just a phrasing which tells it like it really is. Fossil gas is it's not a bridging fuel, it's a fossil fuel, and it needs to be phased out. Great, hopefully that's clarified that one. Thanks, Neil. Um, a slightly different uh, angle of question now, um, whether or not, well, whether we can comment on the value of climate change litigation in advancing climate goals, there's been growing numbers of climate litigation cases. Um, so Bill, perhaps, do you want to take that one? Yeah, look, it's a really good question. And actually, the, the, the number of climate cases being taken globally is, uh, in some sense, exploding. It's increasing exponentially uh, all over the world. And it is having an impact on government and corporate behaviour. Um, so it's actually really valuable. Um, obviously, litigation in this space reflects a frustration and a fear that governments are not taking enough action. Um, and so we, we're seeing, we've seen actions in the Netherlands, for example, the famous Agenda case. We've got a, a, a case just announced in Europe, um, the GLAN case based on human rights for young people. Uh, we've got cases now in the courts in Australia, which are challenging um, the government's approval of coal mines uh, and so on. So the, these are really important developments that are basically trying to force 
and compel governments legally to take the action that they should otherwise be doing. The California case um, just announced against uh, the fossil fuel companies, including Exxon, Shell, BP, and so on, um, is another kind of litigation that is putting the onus back on the companies that have been misleading the public, lying to the public, uh, and blocking climate action to say, you need now to take responsibility for this. And I think we'll see more of that. And uh, I, I think that's going to become more important in the future than we've seen in the past for getting the right kind of action in place. Super. Um, so then a couple of questions on Germany. So uh, we've had a question on uh, why we have ranked Germany as going in the wrong direction with regards to fossil gas. And also if we can comment on, on why we've uh, treat Germany as a separate um, assessment to the EU27. Uh, so Hannah, I'll hand over to you for that one. Yes, um, thank you. Um, first of all, um, why we treat Germany separately from the EU, I think that, so we, we look at a few member states um, in the CAT um, as, as the uh, individual countries, but most of them are grouped under the EU. And of course, also whatever Germany does feeds into the EU rating. Um, we evaluate them a little bit different in the renewables area because um, Germany is yeah a bit closer to implementation and um, has really implemented um, very technical policies um, that are pushing rumors, and we are seeing this picking up. Um, of course, the the instruments that the EU has at their disposal is a bit different, so it's a bit difficult to compare them directly. Um, eventually, whatever the EU decides in terms of targets and regulations um, will have to be implemented by other member states to some extent. Um, so that's why the rating here limits uh, is, is a bit different. Um, and why is uh, Germany rated as wrong direction in terms of fossil gas. So um, we're, as I said, we're looking at the power sector um, and Germany in the power sector is still adding new gas capacities and um, not little. Um, Germany has um, agreed to a clean power sector by 2035 as part of international uh, conversations. But when it then came down to integrating this um, and writing it into law in their renewable energy law, they decided against it. So they still use the terminology of a clean power sector by 2035, which would technically imply a phase out of fossil gas. They still use the terminology, but when it came down to really fixing this in law, they decided against it. So we still, there's a pretty big door open for gas to stay online. Um, and yeah, the additions over the next years will probably run over 2035. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so time is running short now. Uh, I'm gonna end with one final question before asking each of our panelists to give us a brief kind of one minute closing remark. So um, the last question is, um, could we talk about what are the technical challenges to ensuring the continuity of electricity supply with 100% renewable energy sources such as solar and wind and how feasible it will be to overcome these challenges by 2035? Um, Bill, would you like to kick us off on that one? Sure, look, thanks. I think Neil might like to add as well. Um, look, I think every country is facing challenges to get the, um, the grid um, electricity grid built to 21st century standards. Um, so there's no getting around that. That presents uh, technical challenges, it presents planning uh, challenges, but all of the available assessments that have been done, and there are an enormous number now of 100% renewable studies show it can actually be done um, and it can actually work. And we have examples now of, of countries or let's say parts of countries that are now heading or actually in a 100% renewable situation. So um, it can be done. The challenges uh, are really getting government to move fast enough, to provide the rules. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind is that we've emphasized the power sector decarbonization, but alongside that comes a lot of other changes as well, including electrification of transport, um, efficiency in uh, generating heat um, for households and and uh, and industrial applications that are connected together. So we have to move in those directions 
as well simultaneously and collectively that will produce um, the, the feasible solution for 100% renewable energy by the mid 2030s. Yeah, just to, to add to what Bill said, I think, um, yeah, Bill's already summarized the sort of key technical things we need, which is uh, big improvements to the grid infrastructure and uh, the transmission and distribution grids in many countries yeah, are not currently uh, able to integrate large amounts of wind and solar, and that needs to be addressed. We, of course, need uh, energy storage um, and greater deployment of that, and we need to complement this with flexible generation uh, whether that's closed loop geothermal, whether that's pumped hydro, whether that's uh, some use of clean uh, green hydrogen in the power sector. Um, and these challenges are yeah very real uh, and we don't want to play them down. Um, but I think when you compare them to the challenges of living in a world of severe climate disruption and we look at the climate impacts we're already seeing at 1.2 degrees, um, I know which set of challenges I think we need to be addressing on which set of challenges I'd rather be facing. Um, and if we look at yeah the, the scale and pace of innovation in this space, uh, it is really exciting. And I do think there are real grounds for hope that we can address these technical challenges. Great, thank you. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of your questions today. Uh, I've noted a few on the kind of the methods themselves, and there is a wealth of information in the two um, reports that are coming out today. So I'd encourage you to go and take a look and have a have a good read. Um, now to wrap things up, maybe just to note that um, a recording and the slides will be made available on the Climate Action Tracker website. Uh, and also they will be sent to those um, who registered. So watch the space for those. Um, I will go to Hannah, then Neil, then Bill for some final wrap up remarks. Thanks, Claire. Um, yeah, final words uh, from my end um, with a little recommendation um, for political leaders, um, also those meeting in New York. Um, the first recommendation is to really push renewables. And we talk a lot about these benchmarks and um, there are attempts to also break this down more into how much capacity is needed for each country. Um, I think what we all see from these exercises is there can't be too much of renewables, so we will need it, we will use it. Um, we have to push this as fast as possible throughout. Um, and the other recommendation is that this has to be accompanied with a push also for a fossil fuel phase out and that is also now uh, building towards the end of the year for the climate conference this year in the United Arab Emirates. A um, lot of discussions about uh, terminologies of phasing out fossil fuel emissions, uh, phasing out unabated fuels, um, that for me is distracting from what we actually have to do and leaves a big door open for um, fossils to keep um, staying to staying around longer than we can afford. Um, the mistake that people make by actually dropping this little word unabated as Neil showed is really minor. The role that we see for fossil um, CCS is in the power sector is negligible. We, we can afford just dropping this word. We will not make a big mistake. The mistake that we make in leaving this door open for fossils um, to stick around is much bigger. Thank you. Um, I think my, I would I would follow up with Hannah and I would say, um, to quote uh, Ernest Hemingway, change happens slowly and then all at once. Um, and I do just want to reiterate that I think these benchmarks that we're providing here, they are feasible and they are achievable. Uh, we've seen in recent years what happens when the global community really treats an issue as a crisis, the pace of change and mobilisation, which is possible. And so while there are no grounds for complacency, I do really think there are grounds for hope and um, that we can achieve clean electricity by 2040. Um, and so I would just yeah, reiterate that let's drive towards this North Star and achieve clean electricity within a generation. Bill, over to you. Yeah, thanks. A quick clear. Um... I think many people are really fearful of the climate changes that they've observed this year. Um, and many people have suffered. Um, and I know a lot in the climate community are beginning to panic about uh, what's happening at 1.2 degrees of warming. For me, that just reinforces the importance of the one and a half degree limit. We know that we're way off track um, as a global community in reducing emissions, but this report 
is one of the many that shows we can really do this. If we get our act together, our governments, our industries, that we can really reduce emissions fast enough to limit warming to one and a half degrees and prevent much, much worse things from happening. So that's the optimistic message that I'm really hoping gets carried into this Climate Ambition Summit uh, in the next day or so here in New York and overflows into uh, what is undoubtedly going to be a very difficult COP at the end of the year uh, at the Emirates, where we're going to see a big push from the fossil fuel industry to slow this down. I think we can push back against that. We can see that solutions are better, cleaner, and faster for everyone. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope this provides you all with some, some food for thought as we go into these next few months and um, push forward with, um, yeah, hopefully a, a a good outcome from the COP. And with that, I will close the webinar. Um, please check out the report and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.